So on behalf of the Demos team, um, myself, Scott, Pan, Emma, Sumin, and Lena, um, I'd like to thank Carlos and the IPCS for hosting us. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Arts ACT who funded the print issue and um, allowed us to pay our contributors for the first time, which is really exciting, as well as ourselves a little bit, because we do some work. Um, and I'd also like to thank uh, Gorman House, who's been a big help in advising us. And I've also, I'm really happy that they've agreed to host the Canberra launch in April. So that's uh, excellent. Yeah. Um, so we chose the topic for this issue um, like our previous issue on crisis before the pandemic and the summer of bushfires in 2019. Um, and we actually chose it here in this room, brainstorming um, amongst the editors. We were inspired by precarity because it seems to describe a widespread condition and resonate with our colonial, environmental and political and economic conditions. But we also wanted to register a sense of frustration at the potential for the term to be too universalizing, something that goes back to Judith Butler's initial framing of the term. In order for the concept to have clarity and political efficacy, it also needs to be particularized and focused into particular kinds of precarity. Fortunately, that's exactly what many of our contributors um, have done, recalling us from the distractions and petty debates of academic abstraction to the material, bodily, and effective repercussions of and political resistance to precarity. Um, edit editing an issue um, of a journal involves the intermittent devotion of attention that interrupts the distracted attention of our daily lives. Um, it's a pleasure to be able to devote this kind of attention. Um, and I think, at least I hope, that it's a pleasure and a reward for our contributors to have their work submitted to uh, close scrutiny, although sometimes uncomfortable and you know, challenging as well. It can be demanding, but then we like to think that's part of the point. Um, there's something akin to political activism in editing a journal, combining energy and passion with discipline and commitment. They both involve seeing an initial impulse through to the end, backing up inspiration with labor. At the same time, editing a journal like Demos is also a delightful distraction from all the things we're meant to be focusing on, my thesis, uh, teaching, our jobs, and so on. It's a chance to shed institutional constraints discover and experiment with new ideas and forms of writing. The topics of our issues always uh, provoke a fascinating range of responses. Um, in this issue, connecting topics from marketing research in Francis Arn's brilliant piece to environmental governance, feminism and colonialism, the figure of the child, uh, the criminal justice system, racism and ableism. As Demos grows and matures, we've been able not only to pay our contributors, but receive submissions from a number of international contributors. COVID has meant we've thought a lot about how to support writers. Uh, one of the founders of Logic Magazine, Moira Weigel, remarked that a primary motive for having a journal is to hold parties. Uh, for this issue, we've collaborated with the IPCS, who we've heard hold great parties. And this is testament to that, despite the technical glitches. Um, it's also meant that we've asked ourselves and our contributors to reflect on the ongoing effects of colonialism around the world. As we think about our next issue, um, we will continue that task and expand it to new themes. So look out for our call for submissions and please consider sending us your work. And don't be too intimidated by the excellent qualities of, uh, quality of the writers who've generous, generously agreed to speak tonight. Um, so thank you all for coming and now back to Carlos to introduce our speakers. Fantastic, Scott. Thank you, Scott. So um, if the order of speakers hasn't changed, um, we'll have um, Anastasia speak first. Um, I'll just say a few words. I'll read um, Anastasia's bio here. Um, so Dr. Anastasia Candiere is a researcher, writer and casual academic based in Nam. A PhD thesis um, titled Whiteness and the Myth of Innocence, Tracing a Textual Entanglement, examined the function of innocence in the production and maintenance of racial hierarchies 
Um, it was um, submitted in two years ago in, and conferred hopefully soon after that. Um, great to have you here, um, Anastasia. Um, I wrote the essay that is published in this journal while I was pregnant for the first time. At that point, it was one particular site of vulnerability that obsessed me, my nauseated growing body, becoming a being consisting of two spines, the relentless strength and the frightening fragility of life taking shape inside me, but not entirely of me. The child embodies vulnerability, the gestating body perhaps still more so. I wrote this essay to try to understand this vulnerability, to try to locate it meaningfully in a world of securitization and precarity. This essay asks, what does the securitized world mean for the child? And what does the child mean for the securitized world? Precarity highlights concerns with notions of vulnerability, security and risk. The contemporary world is more chaotic and insecure than ever, or so at least we are told leaving all life more vulnerable than ever to the ripple effects of civil war, disease, famine, financial instability. In this context, the functions of reproduction and care which necessarily attach to the child become especially important. But my children are grown up now. Their bodies and mine are intact, separate. We've become clean and proper bodies. I can't even quite remember now the frightening vulnerability of the hungry baby's lamplit wail in the middle of the night, the libidinous thirst, the interplay of love and exhaustion. Now my children kiss my cheeks stickily before they ride their bikes to school. In uniforms, they button themselves. This year, it is another kind of precarity that has obsessed me. In 2020, when the pandemic hit the Australian university sector, it was casual workers who absorbed the shock. Before then, we thought we could scarcely be more vulnerable, more marginalised. We thought, I did at least, that we were at rock bottom. Scraping contract to contract, haunted by debt, haunted by guilt, always wondering if we were doing too much or just enough scab labour to ensure the next job. I was lucky, I had savings. I would make sure to meet casual colleagues for lunch in the first week of semester after summer and just happened to bring too much food. Come on, help me finish it. We had leftovers, the kids didn't like it. Most people's credit cards maxed out after three months without pay. I had savings, I was lucky. I always had lunch. I had a fancy PhD scholarship with a travel allowance, I was lucky. I talked to another casual academic at the after party of a conference. He told me he had put the exorbitant registration fee on his credit card. He and his partner had a baby on the way. He couldn't afford to miss the networking opportunity, he said. I went home not long after that, to the hotel room my institution had paid for because I was lucky. We were all lucky, if not luck lucky enough. I had my fancy scholarship. He had a supervisor who threw him work. She was walking down the corridor at the right time to get the RA gig she turned into an ongoing job. We faced it alone, mostly, except for shouting each other the occasional lunch or reading each other's job applications for jobs we wouldn't get. We were lucky or we weren't. We were lucky to be there. Neoliberalism prefigures a subjectivity which is, as Maurizio Lazzarato argues, constituted by its relationship to debt. From the neoliberal power relation emerges a subject in a constant and inescapable relationship with debt. Maturity is proved through the debt relation the passage to adulthood in most industrialized nations inextricably linked to the debt relation of student loans. Participation is obligatory. The only way to constitute oneself as a responsible subject worthy of trust is to have taken on, managed and repaid debt. Lazzarato uses Nietzsche to connect the debt relation to an ethic of guilt, observing the similarity between the German words Schulden for debts and Schuld for guilt. The logic of debt resituates the precarity of life onto the individual who is guilty of owing, guilty of spending beyond her means, guilty of insufficient flexibility to survive the debt economy. We've been guilty like that in private. The first time we held an event with the network of casualized, unemployed and precarious university workers, we called it solidarity and precarity. 
it was little more and nothing less than witnessing. Later, a friend wrote to me, Kapow is a powerful and wonderful idea. There is more to collectivism than simply political or economic change. First, people need the dignity of their humanity and the celebration and support to be brave enough to choose that dignity. We stopped being guilty in private. And when we brought our guilt into public, it looked like a public. It looked like connection. In her, in her nostalgic lament about the death of the humanities in the university, Emeritus Professor Judith Brett writes that permanent staff, many of whom started their teaching career in much better paid circumstances, know that casuals are exploited and underpaid, but restricted by tight budgets, they are rarely able to do anything except apologise a little guiltily. As a unionist, I might comment that apology isn't actually all that workers can do to show one another solidarity. But here instead, I want to talk about the guilt that is invoked. I've written elsewhere about the limitations of guilt as political practice. The guilt of the privileged, though, is different to the guilt of the indebted. Instead of feeling guilty for doing too little, we feel guilty for doing too much. Instead of feeling guilty about opulent salaries and tenured positions, we feel guilty about our debts, our failure to transcend the purgatory of precarity, our ongoing marginality. We are the guilty, embarrassing reminder in the hallowed halls that things have changed since those golden days, which Brett and her ilk hark back to. The guilt of the precarious is like debt. And as Fred Moten and Stefano Hani show us, debt proliferates. Indebtedness spreads, ensnares us in other collectives. In the corporate university on stolen land, there are a lot of unpaid debts, most of them not even reckoned. But the debts that get documented are to something imagined, something failing, something we've realised we failed at and that, more importantly, we want to fail. We've chosen not to honour our debts, not to the white settler academy, not to the liberal arts tradition that has shaped so many of us, not to the union officials who gave us free membership for eight weeks, not to the subject coordinators to whom we should be grateful for being treated well, for being treated less than badly. Thanks for following up on my very late contract. Thanks for noticing I'm working for free. Thanks for mentioning that I'm not at the meeting after it's already too late for me to be at the meeting. We've stopped being grateful. Instead of the debts we owe these institutions, we've thought about the debts we owe each other. You who held space for me, who made it possible, who let me have hope. Fred Moten writes, you can't count how much we owe one another. It's not countable. It doesn't even work that way. You can't count it, but you can sit with it. It feels good, like I'm finally watching the right tally. It feels less like guilt and more like owing. Not that we're here to pay our de debts, not to settle the record, but to get deeper into debt to each other. You've done so much for me already that I can never pay it back. Here's me trying, comrade. Here's me hoping always that there will be more to repay. Thank you, Anastasia. So, Following on, we've got um, Darcy Davy. So, fix this up. Darcy works on uh, Woi Wurrung we Country, having recently returned from three years working in the UK. Darcy is completing a BA in Literature and Creative Writing. Poetry matters to her, as does life writing. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Hello? Yep. Um, I'll be reading uh, the poem that is in the journal today. It's called Today Impending. Blood orange sun burning and tar melts under peach haze while house sails obscure in custard winds. Coughing, hacking, strangling to breathe and soft fur faces as singed and bloodied Birds falling are like dying while flying, like drink driving, and trees turn to less cozy fireplaces. 
the kind of charcoal you draw with, draw with, but all of it petrified. Lush, tall, sap and viridian, now cigarette chimneys. A fantasy of creepers playing spot the next to barbecue. 380 pilots stranded, a mass whale suicide. We can't talk about the why of it. It's not related, doesn't mean it's not related. A rainbow reef, now white bone bleak, and that forever stuff, twisted and choking. A six pack of turtles, fossils in every gut, and the tide keeps washing closer. I don't want to be here. The kind of anger that has no place to go when his breath stopped breathing. And the blues yelled checkmate while their ivory pieces still patterned the board. A polarized state with a Grand Canyon cutting like magnets, not photos. But you can't look away because it's on replay. Chasms in the chest, blood blooming flowers, just running or watching TV. It's a color contradiction, like fluorescent orange and hair pieces. And I wish flowers would bloom on his chest instead. Stop the boats and make Australia white again. A globe so admiring when it's fiercely anti-black. Normalize catastrophe, like how brown people in tents and borders is normal. Like how begging for permission to live is normal. Like how fracturing histories of ancient people is normal, as long as there's that shiny rainbow black stuff at the end of it, the petrified kind. Bleeding heads against brick wall conversations, train tracks down faces and banshee screams and crushing doors, splits and foundations between generations, roots, roots rotting and decaying and festering, but fungus growing. At least the worms will be happy. You don't belong here either. Does COVID count as SHTF? Has the shit hit the fan yet? Maybe we should prep our storerooms, like how I know how to can meat now. But I wish conspiracy theories didn't normalize Nazism. I'd almost believe them. The interstellar lizards stealing wealth and power, but not Silurians, is almost easier. Like the audacity that Jeff has enough dollars to fix it, but I guess he's a lizard too. Don't get confused with fiction, like the apocalypse could be stopped with a Scooby gang and a school of explosives. But it's not just that, it's all of it. The whole burning lot of it. I keep checking for jellyfish stings or nightmares, like that's why I'm a sack of anxiety. And I stare at my veins like they'll strangle me and like my breath on the window is a parasite. And I wonder where the lie is when it's daily and why the tragedy insists on being normalized. The stars keep getting heavy and the future feels like nowhere. I don't think I belong here, but there's nowhere else to go. Thanks, Darcy. And following on, we've got um, um, Gian Maria Lenti um, speaking. I had a brief chat with um, Gian Maria when he came a little bit earlier. Um, he made me think he was a Mexican, but in fact, he's um, Italian who's been working in Mexico for some time. So, Gian Maria Lenti is a PhD candidate in social anthropology at the National School of Anthropology in Mexico City. His research explores the experiences and emotions of migrants in transit through Mexico, Turkey, and Greece. He recently conducted a research stay at um, Oizegun University in Istanbul, Turkey, while currently appointed as honorary affiliate of the Department of Social Inquiry at La Trobe University in Melbourne. His research interests include social anthropology, 
forced display, displacement, border studies, gender studies, biopower, agency, and resistance. Jan Maria. Thank you, Carlos. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> Good evening, all. Thank you. Thank you for the Demos editorial team for their great work. Thank you for the Institute for having us over and creating this great event. And thanks for all accompanying us today, either here or online, Facebook, YouTube, whatever. And I want to especially thank all those migrants, activists, NGO workers, without whom this research wouldn't, be, wouldn't have been possible. So in this, in this occasion, I will introduce an article uh, I'm publishing here in this uh, special issue on precarity. Uh, hoping you find some time to have a deeper look at it and especially at the direct testimonies and pictures that sustain the arguments presented herein. The article title is Precarity Reborn from Its Own Ashes on the Opening of a Reception and Identification Center in Lesbos, Greece. All right, probably many of them are wondering what's the connection between refugee camps and post-colonial studies? or why should this topic be, should be addressed in an issue on precarity? The reason is that the humanitarian system is part of an international regime that dictates the rules of human mobility, determining who have VC access to cross international borders and those who must embark on irregular journeys or are compelled to deal with a humanitarian system that reproduces colonial power relationship of rights, privilege and oppression. But let's now move to, to the case study presented in this article. Between September 8 and 10, 2020, amidst the COVID-19 pandemic, Moria Reception and Identification Center in the Asian island of Lesbos burned to the ground. The fire extended to the olive grove and Nadia Chen property where underprivileged migrants who had been excluded from the camp had erected their own precarious abodes. Most of their inhabitants were people whose only crime was fleeing war, persecution, poverty, climate change, and epidemics. After their arrival to Greek shores, these people were forced into the probable living conditions, extreme deprivation, and danger, awaiting for months or even years for the out outcome of their asylum application. This article centers on the implications of Moria's destruction and its repercussions for migrants who used to inhabit in its overcrowded tents. Firstly, it discusses the implication of its existence within the nexus between border regimes and humanitarianism. Successively, a set of ethnographic photographs taken during fieldwork provides an idea of what everyday life meant for migrants who were stranded in Moria. In conjunction with this visual data, direct testimonies of NGOs, workers, volunteers, and activists who operated in the island contrast with the new plans proposed respectively by the EU and Mitsotakis government as a solution to the European refugee crisis. During fieldwork that was conducted between November and December 2019, Moria was the biggest and most overcrowded camp in Europe, hosting more than 18,000 asylum seekers, despite being designed for a maximum capacity of 3,000. Migrants in Moria lacked adequate housing, sufficient toilets and showers, nourishment, health attention, legal aid, access to education and psychological support. To put an example, while recently the World Health Organization had made the recommendation to wash hands as frequently as possible, uh, of course, to avoid the spread of coronavirus, in Moria, only one shower was available, available for every 500 people. Even before the pandemic, numerous NGOs and activists had been operating in and out of Moria camp to help attenuate the suffering and precarity of its population. Remarkably, these aid workers engaged in tasks that are within the competence of both the Greek state and the EU, who would just choose to invest millions in building their own security apparatus. The European mechanism to control human mobility can be understood as a multilayered regime that is composed by multiple countries, institutions, practices, and discourses. The securitization of borders sees the EU interrupting migrants' journeys in third countries by means of multilateral agreements. Simultaneously, dominant discourses are being politically used to enshrine the benefits of the humanitarian system that welcomes those lucky who make it to European shores. And this, especially after the 2000, uh, 2016 uh, EU-Turkey deal. 
Since then, the confinement of migrants on Lesbos has continuously been presented as the benevolent side of the European security apparatus. By doing so, attention is drawn toward the supposed neutrality and the political character of humanitarianism and its role within a broad, wider project of border control that amalgamates compassion and repression. While such strategy has been instrumental for the protection of European interests, the approach used in Lesbos has entailed serious consequences for those who were confined in the island during determinate timeframes. As shown in the article, even when these migrants are provided with scarce basic means to survive, their circumstances in the island are markedly colonized by a lack of security and stability. Furthermore, the precarity of their living conditions compounds with feelings of coercion that arise from the impossibility of leaving the islands, and in case of women and children, even the avoidance of leaving the family stand in order to minimize exposure to the camp's threats. It should not be forgotten that the time migrants spend in the island has a determinative impact on their present. By finding themselves confined into a system in which their rights are relatively suspended, those who fled traumatizing realities in search of peace may experience a deterioration in their capacity for endurance and resilience. In this sense, Moria's dwellers are stuck in an indeterminate limbo of precarity that impacts on their well being by intersecting with previous traumas. Evidently, Whilst humanitarianism is founded on the mission of improving people's living conditions, the case of Moria demonstrates its degenerative effects and the role it plays within the EU border regime. The days following Moria's initial international news was inundated with images of nameless bodies saving themselves, saving themselves from the blaze that consumed their abodes. On one side, the media portrayed Greek authorities throwing tear gas against people of any age, gender, or anyone. On the other one, European Commission's President Ursula von der Leyen referred to Moria as a stark reminder that underlies the need to create sustainable solutions for Europe's migration crisis. Regrettably, at the local level, a new camp has been quickly erected to host those people whose momentary abode were the roads of Lesbos. Nevertheless, the recently inaugurated Lesbos RIC camp has already provoked numerous controversies. The new location is exposed to the inclemency of the sea and severe weather conditions, creating doubts about the suitability of the site's poor infrastructure to face the challenges of winter time. Moreover, showers and latrines are not sufficient, while food is still served only once a day. Meanwhile, activists have been banned from distributing food to people in need as the criminalization of solidarity is on the rise. Finally, the Greek government is proposing to convert the new camp into an open-air prison. Such an approach was thought to be implemented in all Asian islands where a camp was already operating, although the social pressure that emerged at the international level put this plan on standby. Meanwhile, most international reaction to the humanitarian emergency that flourish, flourished from Moria's disintegration reiterated the lack of EU's commitment in providing palpable solutions to ameliorate migrants' living conditions and protect their civil rights and human dignity. While widespread political discourses are commiserating with the circumstances in Lesbos, the only practical responses to the problem consisted in sending emergency supplies such as tents and blankets, while some few hundred migrants were accepted for relocation in some European countries. However, as people continue to leave their countries to escape unendurable existences, such an approach could be conceived as an attempt to use a teaspoon to remove water from a sinking boat. No political action has been taken at the institutional level that does not reproduce an evidently unsustainable and violent humanitarian system of confinement. Two weeks after Moria's disappearance, the new Pact on Migration and Asylum was promulgated by the European Commission, anticipating a renovated phase of the contemporary border regime that contrasts with the romanticized idea of a benevolent and welcoming Europe. While echoing a rhetoric permeated by solidarity, the above mentioned political strategy will straighten the sea and land security apparatus, implement fast track screenings to deport migrants even before they can apply for asylum, delegate deportation tasks to countries that are notoriously hostile towards migrants, and also further expand the EU borders through multilateral agreements. 
Upgrading, upgrading Greece border control regime is an increased attempt at keeping migrants away from Europe, in spite of the social consequences of such politics in terms of migrants' precarity, confinement, and even exposure to death. Rather than being a stark reminder of the past, the end of Moria represents a dark anticipation of the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gianmaria. So following on, we've, um, we've got um, Josie Dean, who's a writer and student at the University of Melbourne. Their work has appeared in Cordite, Southerly, Australian Poetry and Overland, among others. They were one of the recipients of the 2013 457 Visa Poetry um, and Project and were shortlisted for the 2015 Marsden and Hachette Prize for Poetry. They live on unceded Wurundjeri land here in Nam. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ah, I wasn't, um, I didn't really know what to expect from this particular evening. So um, I didn't, I haven't prepared uh, much except for the poems that appear in Demos itself. And I will read them after maybe giving like a gloss on uh, at least the first one, which I feel requires like a minimum of context, just in that. So during uh, during 2020, um, during like the the period of grace between the two lockdowns, my partner and I moved out of uh, a share house where we had been for uh, about a year at that point to um, look for uh, a place to move in together, uh, just the two of us, um, uh, and that involved sort of tra uh, traversing the incredibly bizarre or the heightened reality of like the Melbourne housing market in that particular period of time between like the first lockdown and the second lockdown. And it was incredibly strange, um, not least because, um, not least because in this context, in the context of this poem, uh, <laughs> I, I guess my partner and I decided to to, I, to play a play a prank for want of a better term and we noticed uh we noticed in Brunswick an auction taking place in this like historical or semi-historical like uh, block of apartments sorry the plosives plosive. um yeah sorry semi-historical like block of apartments uh all these people out in the street uh bidding and such you know people uh in their like mid 30s 40s 50s and then here's my partner and I who are like dressed like this and very obviously not uh straight or cis and it was really fun uh you know has, going like two hundred thousand dollars please on a house the, yeah kind of a pure fantasy that like no um that I would never be able to like uh uh, like the purest fantasy I could ever have in that like I will never see that kind of money ever in my life and I will never be able to, to afford a house and it reminded me I guess now back in the context of the poem of like a sort of perverse saying that I remember um Wallace Stevens said in that money is a form of poetry and like a part of that felt a part of that is like a kind of perverse because like at least traditionally you know money is the furthest thing from poetry in the world and on the other hand, it reveals something about poetry's, you know, material reality, its economy, and its basis in systems of privilege and and power and economic, like economic, like uh, I'm thinking of a word. I guess I don't want to say exclusion, but you know, force basically. And I guess there was something intoxicating about being not cis, not straight in that particular place. And playing with this imaginary money, like poetic imagery that I'd never be able to like, um, you know, that obviously I'd never be able to have in reality. And so I, I wrote this as a response to all of that. And the poem is called Auctioneering and it's prefaced by, thank you. It's prefaced by a quote by Anne Carson, the poet. And it goes, sorry. Yeah, if poetry, if prose is a house, uh, poetry is a man on fire running quite fast through it. 
You take photos of the auction, the world's straightest Mardi Gras. They fill the streets like the opposite of rubble. You have no skin here. You raise $100,000 and watch the boomers' eyes burst. Who is this piece of shit? Until a guy in aviators tops you, smirking. It is a fine property. It used to be a tram depot. The courtyard smells of persimmon, heritage listed, etc. It would have made a wonderful trans queer share house. We'd lay out a huge cuddle puddle mattress in the living room. The blinds open resplendently. It's quiet, vertical, a ship's prow made into a fantasy tavern slash boutique clothes store with only us as proprietors and we say, fuck your propriety. Vines drink from the balcony, thirsting after water troughs left out deliberately for them. Butcher paper lines the walls where we don't simply paint over everything. We watch the rain in woven deck chairs after the end of the world, resting at last. Sold, someone says, and the aviator's fist pumps. Ah oh, well, nonetheless, it was a beautiful poem, wasn't it? <laughs> and that's it. And how am I going for time? And the second one is just called quarantine gardening, which is uh, about the experience of, of um, chatting with my family in Sydney during quarantine and their experiences with gardening. Yeah. <laughs> you can't tell if your family gave up growing vegetables. Your mum, gazing over, wishes for peaches. Our turmeric slash sage slash parsley, the talking herb we call it in our family language, tastes like nothing. Night time in the garden, you observe minute LEDs like Victorian era street lamps, an east end of plant compost slash worm nutrients, a vast nameless movement. Thank you. Thank you, Josie. And um, our final collaborator, contributor to demos for today is um, Tegan Crowley. Um, and just wanted to say that, um, think of some questions and some points you might wanna raise in the Q&A after this. We're gonna have a very brief Q&A in a little while. Okay, so Tegan Crowley is a multidisciplinary artist known for her work in film and television, um, writing, uh, sorry, winning best actor in 2016, in the Made in Melbourne Film Festival. She has worked alongside Blazing Arrow Films and CF Films on three feature films, both as an actress and writer, performing full improvised dialogue, for example. And based in Melbourne, she currently works as, a, as an actress, writer, photographer, and singer-songwriter in, in the band The Urban Crowley Collective, and is writing her debut novel as well. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. Um, I just wanted to quickly say thank you to the Demos team. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure working on the edits and I'm incredibly humbled and grateful to be part of this alumni of a whole bunch of incredibly empathic and intelligent people. So thank you. Um, my, my story is called Nay Stokes and I'm just gonna jump right in. My auntie had become terminally ill the recently found melanoma had spread and was now rapidly taking over her body. I flew up to Queensland to see her with my family, not knowing then it was to be the last time I would ever see her again. Bundaberg was hot. I felt suffocated staying with my family after having had my own place for the better part of a month and was confronted by the circumstance of our cramped visit. What do you talk about with someone who's about to die? Posing in family photos framed with the subtext of impending death. Everyone floundering beneath the gigantic elephant in the room as it casts its enormous shadow over everything you think, say, and do. You bumble around in the darkness feeling like everything you do is wrong. Lost in its shadow, you become forced to reflect on your own life and mortality, knowing that your day will one day come. As the minutes tick by, you become excruciatingly aware that you can't get that second back and she's one step closer to death. I wondered what she was thinking in her final days. I selfishly pondered, 
Did she ever really like me? Did she still love me? Did it even matter? Did she know that when she looked into my eyes with her superpower stare, just how much I wished I could freely communicate my love for her? But because I'm an oversensitive emotional wreck who loses my voice anytime I'm faced with real love and truth, instead of expressing this love, I sit in silence, trying pathetically to send telepathic messages straight into her heart and brain. Facing her in the darkened lounge room, I just sat dumb. I sat silent and stared, contemplating how short life is, how suddenly cruel and unfair. I longed for something smart to share. I wanted to distract her, to gift her with a smile. I wished to make her laugh and I prayed to take her pain, but all the while I still sat dumb. Instead of reaching out to properly connect, I just sat silent and stared. To me, the most excruciating thing to witness is the effect a terminal illness has on the surrounding loved ones. The life partner is losing his love and best friend. The mother is losing her firstborn. The siblings, my mother and uncle, are losing their sister and my cousins are losing their mum. It's brutal to behold and shames the thoughts I keep thinking about not being worthy enough. To witness a person who is losing the love of their life is a privilege, viciously bringing into focus what really matters in life. It makes your egoic yearnings become greatly insignificant. Their love distilled becomes potent and fleeting and feels too strong to bear. I'm forever changed by the amount of love I saw in my uncle's eyes as he nursed my aunt. His beautiful, proud love made his eyes glitter and shine bright for us all to bask in, illuminating our way through the shadow we were all lost in. Two weeks later, I was assisting a workshop showing student directors how to build rapport with actors. Together, we broke down scenes from their final films in hopes of readying them from, for their impending shoots. I left the session just after midday, feeling elated and happy to help and encourage the young creatives. Glancing down to check the time on my phone, I saw I had a missed call from mum. She's gone, I thought. I began to cry on the street as I walked to the tram stop, calling mum back for confirmation. Choked with tears as I sat on the tram back to Brunswick, I listened as mum gave me our plans to fly back to Bundaberg for our final goodbye. On the day of the service, I chose to wear white. I couldn't stand to shroud myself in black. My aunt loved fashion and had spent her life making textiles and clothing, always searching for interesting fabrics to create with. I dressed with care for her. We arrived at a small church surrounded by big gum trees. As we parked the car, I was surprised by how many people were already there. Everyone was so well dressed in floral dresses and suits. I saw at a distance my uncle and cousins in their crisp, clean suits and felt my throat and stomach constrict. In a daze, I got out of the car and I waded through the dispersed funeral guests. As I approached the mouth of the modest church, I began to hyperventilate. With knees buckling, I couldn't cross the threshold. It felt like there was a force field rendering it impossible for me to step closer to my aunt's casket, which lay at the front of the church. For strength, I looked to my uncle. I'll never forget his face. Grief was etched so deeply, colouring his eyes black like endless pits. The force of his sorrow became too much to witness. To stop myself from completely collapsing, I began to fight the weakness in my knees. I tried in vain to calm my nerves and to breathe steadily as I walked to the front pew to sit with my family. When I finally made it to my seat, I was taken aback by the beautiful crown of native flowers that dressed her coffin. She lay majestic, decorated with her favorite bush flowers skillfully arranged by my uncle. I was floored by their beauty and they became the strength I needed to get me through her service. In a dream, I watched, listened and learned. Folk music played as old photographs illustrated the stage. She was a true beauty. The 1960s black and white photographs taken in her youth looked like beautiful scenes in vogue. In her older years, she happily camped, fished, explored, collected, mothered, grandmothered and smiled. Then the photographs from our recent visit came back to haunt me. 
magnified for all to see. Seeing the way we all desperately clung to her seemed to sober me from my grief. Electrified, I wanted to seize the day, explore the world, fall in love, experience life. I wanted to bloom. Flying back to Melbourne, I felt completely altered and changed as a person. She had brought me back to life. Watching the fluffy clouds from my seat as we sped by, I ruminated. Shine your eyes on the ones you love. Never apologize and never hide. Thank you.